Hey, I looked for Hanukkah. Last day of Hanukkah, so last day of Hanukkah, high point of this uh, holiday of renewal of Jewish Renaissance. So apropos that we're starting two new series. You know, we just an hour ago we uh, began a series on the Rambam tomorrow in the Bukham, the Maimonides Guide to the Perplex, and and we're taking now uh, you know starting another classic book that's actually older and it's a different approach called the Kuzari by the famous. Uh, Jewish thinker and poet reviewed Yudah Levi, who was actually uh, lived a generation or two before the Rambam, uh, but also from the same heritage of Moorish Spain. He himself was a uh, student of the Rif, who was the Rebbe of the Rebbe of the Rambam's father. Rabbi, Rabbi Maimon, the Rambam's father, was a Talmud of the Rimi Gash, who was a Talmud of the Rif. You know, Review Levy was also Talmud of the Riff and uh, also wrote a poem when the, his disciple, the Rimi Gash, got installed as the Rosh Yeshiva, the head of the academy, in the Riff's stead. By the way, we do plan to start a series on Riff also. I figure, you know, this is a, uh, you know, this holiday is all about the uh, Jewish Renaissance in general and also how Judaism can cope with philosophy and, and secular culture. The Rambam had his approach to Mount Bukham, the Kudri, uh, not so, doesn't look to synthesize. He doesn't look to synthesize and reconcile. His approach is just to stick up for Judaism, against philosophy, against Christianity, against Islam, and to do it in, in a very straightforward, commonsensical way, just showing the beauty of Judaism. Uh, not so much to, uh, well, it's a different approach than the, the Rambam's agenda. And I, I don't want to give a whole, uh, you know, you know, discourse as to what Halevi's, uh, Philosophy is because uh, you, you'll you'll take you'll see it from experience. We'll go through the book together with God's help. Yeah, you know, as we go through the Rambam's Mordechai, also with God's help, and you'll be able to compare and contrast yourself. But to do that, you'll have to subscribe. You must subscribe to our channel. Soon, we're going to stop giving this content out for for free on the general broadband, you know, open airwaves. You know, we're going to try to. Uh, you know, curtail it only for the party faithful. All you got to do is subscribe. But here's the, 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 the main reason why you have to subscribe, right? I'm not going to necessarily give this class, you know, uh, you know, at the same time, on the same days, week in, week out. You know, I have a crazy schedule. But if you're subscribed, you get notifications. So if you can catch it live, you catch it live. But if you don't catch it live, it's stored on the channel. You know, and you'll know that another installment was delivered. So please subscribe, subscribe, do yourself a favor, and then you also get all the other good stuff. We have a we have a series on the Rambam's commentary on the Mishnah, going through Mishnah with Rambam's commentary, and we're going to also start doing Aruch you know, to law the learn you know Jewish law in an analytical way, as only the Aruch Hashulchan can deliver, analytical yet concise with final contemporary rulings. It's unbelievable work, the Aruch Hashulchan. And if you know that material code, you can go to a rabbi and ask to be tested and, and, and yourself be ordained. Get smicha as a rabbi. If you know the our you know the Orachaim, it could be uh smichas chaver, which is now very big in a lot of Orthodox congregations. A lot of lay people are, even though they're they're not they're not rabbis and they're not planning on being rabbis professionally, they're learning this curriculum that will get them the title rabbi. Smicha, or rather, you know, the title Chaver, which is a type of rabbi. Um, I had a grandfather who was a Chaver. You know, Mecca's used to use the type of, um, you, know, you know, for depending on which level of learning you're at, right? And, uh, but we're also going to do the Orach Shulchan on Yeridea, which has the laws of Kashrus, the law of Nida, you know, the laws of family purity. And if you know all that stuff and, and you find a rabbi that's willing to give you a comprehensive test, that rabbi can ordain you as a full rabbi with Yara Yara. So lots of good stuff. You know, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what we're offering. So subscribe to the channel. So that way you, you'll know what's out there and, and you'll make sure to keep up with whichever series you want to stick with. Or heck, you know. Just catch a discourse here and there. Last night we gave some great philosophical discourse explaining the unique meaning of this final day of Hanukkah. So don't deprive yourself. All right, subscribe to this channel. Anyway, so uh, like we were saying, Rabbi Al Levi is even you know uh, lived over 800 years ago. He was older than the Rambam in Moorish Spain, 
uh, like I said, he was even older than the Rebbe of the Rambam's father. I said, as I recall, the, he wrote a poem when the Rimi Gash got in stalls right there, which the Rimi Gash like a teenager at the time. It's a phenomenal prodigy. And Rudolf Levy, you know, with the poem, he composed prayers that the Svaradim say on the uh, high holy days, you know, incorporate in their prayers. But he was a, he was a great, uh, very, very learned man. And, and he, he knew philosophy, he disagreed with much of it. He knew Greek philosophy, he knew Kalam, which was the rage of the times, and he deals with it in the fifth essay of this book. But like he, he advocates, you know, simple, wholesome faith and just shows the commonsensical, self-evident beauty and deep meaning of Judaism. The book is written in a very straightforward way. It's not complicated at all. But of course, since it's meanings of the Torah, it's a person who is a deep person will see depth in it and will be able to cross-reference it with Kabbalah and philosophy, you know, see the parallels or how he has that in mind and is, you know, in a backhanded way, you know, dismissing an idea from philosophy. So the deep man sees deep stuff here. But even the uh, more simple Jew, you know, also gets a great deal out of it. There's not a type of book that if you don't read it on a deep level, you get nothing, right? This book is like multi-leveled. You know, you know, you know what it's like. It's totally different literary style. You know what it's like. It's like Rashi on Chumash. It could be learned simply and, and very enjoyable. Or, you know, we know that whole books were written to explain it from halachic perspective, from explaining what irked him in the Pasuk that, that forced him to insert this commentary, like what un, unasked, un, non, which non-verbalized question was that he have in mind that he was coming to answer. And there's also books that, you know, take Rashi philosophically. The Kuzri is a book like that, you know, even on the face of it, so beautiful, so meaningful. You know, it, it's the beauty of, of common sense and self-evident beauty, self-evident meaning. But he says in a way that, you know, the deep man gets deep stuff out of it and the more simple person gets more simple stuff out of it. And that's why the Vilna Bone advocated learning Kuzri instead of the um, other books that come to reinforce the faith. Because he says, yeah, the other books, they raise questions and, and they're complicated. And maybe sometimes the questions are better than the answers. Maybe, you know, the, uh, yeah, you, know, you know, you don't click with the academic rigor, so you're left with doubts, you know. He advocated learning Kuzri. Right. Um, instead of the Shahichud of the Chavos Halabavos, and uh, and like I said, uh, it's full of meaning, self-evident meaning, and and it's amazing that you know both Lithuanians, you know, Misnagdim and Hasidim both, you know, took from this book, enjoyed this book. Right. There's a, it's, right. It is, uh, and and it discusses sometimes interesting things that it was way ahead of its time. Like he contemplates ideas that help us resolve where is the date line, how the halachic date line on the globe. It's not, it's not near the secular date line, the secular international date line. You know, he like he was a very learned man, and in his beautiful way of explaining things, touches upon big ideas, right? But in such a way that the a person who doesn't have such a big head also gets plenty of it. But the person with the big head sees tremendous stuff that he's alluding to, uh, the nuggets that are hidden there, or just tracing that meaning that he presents so nicely to a uh, deeper, higher level. Right? It's just a wonderful book, and it, it's quite an ancient book, really. It's very old. It's more than 800 years old. Like I said, it was, uh, it was old in the Rambam's days. Now, another thing is, you know, you know so it, it's written so beautifully with the, the poetic soul shining through, even though it should be pointed out that it was originally written in Arabic, you know. Uh, but, of course, it was. It must have been a beautiful Arabic because the translation to Hebrew is also beautiful. Uh, it's, a, you know, um, and it's also said, you know, you know being a, a poet and, uh, and, and a historian and a great storyteller, you know, having all that, you know, knowledge and literary skill. You know, it was, he put it in a historical framework of a, uh, you know, and, and I don't know much about it. And, and the, the, the sources that we have, even in our heritage, 
I don't know exactly how historically accurate they are. I don't know. I just don't know. Right, but he put it in a historical context at 500 years, I believe it is, before his time, right? which means this story happened like in the 16th century, something like that, right? There was a, you know, tribe, you know, a tribal kingdom, you know, uh, you know up in the Ukraine thereabouts. We're in Asiatic Russia. I don't know, Russia, Ukraine, yeah. Asiatic Russia. I, you know, look at a map, guys, right? That uh, converted to Judaism. Why well, the king converted, and after that, you know, the people converted. As I stand historically, first some people converted, and then the, uh, the king converted, and that was like a big watershed, and, uh, and like many, many more converted. Look, you know, uh, you know, so he put it in the context of that because the you know the you know, the legend has it the king was a truth seeker and he uh, he and he went and he interviewed you know philosophers he interviewed Christian thinkers Muslim thinkers interviewed a rabbi and had them you know and debated them and uh, and was convinced by the arguments of the rabbi right that that so uh, so as it were he is like uh, building it into this. Uh, Superimposing, this is for sure, this is Halevi's philosophy. No one thinks otherwise. No credible source thinks that Halevi had some manuscript that was 500 years old. Right? This is Halevi, Yud Halevi's philosophy. This is the way he understood it. Uh, but he's superimposing it on this historical uh, event, uh, you know, putting it you know, as the dialogue between the rabbi who converted the king and the king. First, you know, bringing the philosopher and the Christian and the Muslim on stage and how the king rejected them. And then the ongoing debate between the rabbi and the king, you know, it's all Alevi superimposing his understandings, you know, on that historical event that happened, like I think he says, 500 years before his time. It means it happened a real long time ago. Um, i just say for the record, like, you know, I don't know how much of the history we know uh, from a reliable source, but I just want to say that I reject forcefully, forcefully reject any notion, right, that the Ashkenazi dudes are all kuzarim, right? It's nonsense. I'm 100% Ashkenazi, pure Ashkenazic stock, right? And I know uh, from my mother's mother's side, my uh, ancestry, all the way back to King David. So please give me a break, right? Um, you know, it is a horrible thing to say. I could believe that the Kudarim, you know, uh, when they migrate, especially when their kingdom collapsed, you know, they migrated and they they intermarried with Jews because they were Jewish, I identified as Jew. I could believe that. And I could certainly believe that they, uh, you know, they went down, you know, to some parts of Eastern Europe. And that's where they... Uh, Joint Jewish communities. I, I don't think it's a horrible thing to say that the Baleatesis, the ones who gave us the Tesis, they're all from Kudari. Yeah, I, I can believe that they mixed with us eventually, but uh, not to say discredit the whole Ashkenazi community as all being Kudari, especially the crazier conspiracy that uh, all the Jews today are really Kudari and, you know, we're not the real Jews. God forbid. All right. Okay wanted to make that clear. Anyways, uh, we've given a lengthy introduction, so we'll just have time. Well, I want to keep these installments short. Uh, people who have uh, listened to me, uh, viewed me in the past, so I give these long discourses. That's where I'm just saying my thoughts. Sometimes it's just hard to shut the mind off. But when I'm teaching a book, you know, I want to keep it short. The installments are easy, and you'll have time to listen to, hopefully live. And if not, you have time to listen to it in the car, on the go. And it's easy to, you know, uh, retain and, and memorize, and uh, as opposed to giving too much. And I'm working on that. Even when I say my own thoughts over it, try to keep it more consistent, you know. Uh, okay. So uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll do the very first page uh, because I don't want to start something that I won't finish, you know, because after that comes the philosopher's, uh, you know, the philosopher's piece and what the king says in, you know, to rebut the philosopher. Um, so let's just do at least the, uh, the uh, introduction that the author wrote, which also explains uh, part of the... Uh, you know, historical context that the book is superimposed upon. 
שאול שאלוני, ואתה שואל שהייתי נגד תעשה של חוקים על דתנו, Right. I was asked, you know, by people, Yudha Levy says, I was asked by people in my generation, Judaism was always being trashed, as it is today, by the left, by the left. We have no friends on the left. I'm not saying we have a lot of friends on the right, <laughs> but we definitely have no friends on the left, right? And the anti-Semitism is all coming from the left, please, you know. And because that's a real genuine threat to the Jewish community and the state of Israel at large. Okay, but you know, but Judaism was always this, as you know. So I was asked by my co-religionists for the, the questions and answers that I have, you know, uh, you know, formulated that I could that could be used against the claims of those who argue on our religion. So they have asked me, you know, give us some good, you know, answers, you know. And Judaism. I mean, Ben, I'm trying to you know, the, how we, we are, uh, you know, attacked by those who uh, diss Judaism because they are followers of philosophy. And we, Ben, I mean, that's also how, or, you know, the answers to protect Judaism, defend Judaism against the uh, the other religions, those who believe in other religions. We, Ben, I mean, and also, you know, sadly, you know, we also need defense against our own non-believers amongst the Jewish people. You know, amazing. You know, can't, you know, believe me, we're, we're not going to end early today. Can't help it. You know, it's just so, um, you know, history repeats itself. First of all, you know, he living a little bit over 800 years, like nearly 900 years ago, right, he is repeating the Hanukkah story. You know, the Hanukkah story wasn't just a fight against philosophy, it wasn't just a fight against paganism, you know, the Hellenistic culture was like, you part of my expression, a bastard child of a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of just paganism, you know, Alexander formulated Hellenism, he made a big, you know, that's why it was catchy, you had a little bit of this, a little bit of that, everyone could, you know, find something for everyone, you know, but not much, something for everyone, but not much solid truth, or any, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, so it wasn't so out the Hanukkah struggle wasn't just against the philosophy side of it, you know, or the paganism side of it, it was also uh, a civil war, you know. Uh, sadly, there are many Hellenized Jews, it is, yeah, it was sadly a, a civil war, <laughs> no less than uh, than pushing out the Greek occupation. They were mit you know, because the non believers of Jewish people grabbed onto the secular culture. What can I say? It's the truth. Call me a hater. I don't care. I'm, I'm speaking the truth. It, it, history is repeating itself. Like I said in my Hanukkah lectures, Han, Hanukkah, I called my Hanukkah lectures, Hanukkah War is 2019. The war is still going on. And you know, we're up against the, the leftist academia. Oh God, these nuts that say there's no gender, right? The world's going to end in 12 years if we don't embrace their policies. Right. Socialism is a great idea. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, you know, and how they diss on the Torah values, right? These nuts from the academia, right? These pro-Palestinian, uh, radical pro-Palestinian anti-Semites. And, uh, you know, you know, and, you, know uh, you know, these who are trying to erode our religious liberties, you know, ours and the Christian community's religious liberties, right? And yet, you know, they're not even consistent in that because they'll defend the Muslims because the Muslims and the leftists have made some type of unholy uh, treaty between them. You know, evil knows no principle. You know, uh, evil will hook up with anything for the moment. There's, there's no ideological purity amongst the evil. Anyway, but, uh, but here's the thing, right? We, we are sadly... Sadly, we have Jews that are caught up in this nonsense. Bernie Sanders, such a Jew, caught up in all this craziness. Yeah. Oh. And uh, believe me, uh, I, as a Jew, I am so ashamed of Adam Bullshiff, right? Jerry Nadler, Chuck Schumer. You know, what are they doing? It's just so un-Jewish what they're doing. Right? Horrible. And that's, 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 yeah. 
attacking a president who's the greatest friend that the Jewish people and the state of Israel have ever had in at least 2,000 years, right? Um, so, you know, sadly, you know, uh, you know, you know, the, the fight is, you know, not just the, towards the outside, it's an inner fight also, you know. Sadly, a lot of uh, our Jews, Jewish brothers and sisters are alienated from the thinking and spirit of Judaism. And therefore could be the greatest enemies of the state of Israel or to the Torah. All right, so see, history, history repeats itself. Anyways, so he says, I'm, uh, you know, I had, I've, I've material, you know, stacked up, you know, worked out to defend Judaism against, you know, uh, the philosophers, you know, the, ac the academics, defend Judaism against the uh, pagans and, you know, and the other religions, and to defend Judaism against our own flesh and blood that are rebelling against it or trying to reform or reconstruct. I stand corrected, right? I remembered uh, what I heard yeah, some time ago. Well, you know, you know, I heard some arguments. You know that uh, you know. I don't think he means literally that he's now transcribing all the arguments that were argued. The rabbi argued from the king of the Khazars. He says four hundred years worth. I said five hundred. I stand corrected. 400 years, 400 years before his time. So, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, so no one really believes that he means to say he literally has. You know, he means, you know, he had heard that these were the types of arguments, you know, that went back and forth between the rabbi and the king 400 years earlier in Qajar. Right? So I heard, you know, so I remember the stuff like that. You know, uh, the rabbi argued 400 years ago in front of the king of the Qajars. You know, uh, arguments that because of these arguments, the king accepted the, the faith of the Jews. And this is well known, is already in the history books of his time. All right, so now, uh, so what he means to say is that, you know, uh, I'm writing the type of stuff, you know, that, you know, and in the spirit of the back and forth that happened between the king and the rabbi 400 years earlier. All right. So he said, therefore, therefore, since in the same spirit, and it's a parallel ideas of what probably was argued back and forth, therefore he's going to superimpose his whole book on that historical, in that historical context. Well, Sam and Super Trump, this king, it is written over there in, uh, in whatever historical books, you know, document the story of the Kuzarim. He had a recurring dream, one dream happening to him recurrently. In his dream, an angel comes to him and says to him, your, your heart, your intent, God likes, you know, because God knows. God knows what you're thinking and that you really, really want to do the right thing. So your intent is, you know, is beloved by God. God loved your intent, but he doesn't like what you're doing. And this is a basic premise of this book that comes up over and over and over again. Not enough to have a good heart. You hear that bleed heart liberals? And not that their heart is in the right place either, but they you know, claim they are, right? Or one, they try to con us into thinking it is. It makes no difference. You got to do the right thing, not just have your heart in the right place. You know, you have to do. There is an objective right, an objective right and wrong. That's the whole basis of this book. You know, you've got good intentions, but that, that good intentions don't cut it, right? Of course, you get rewarded for anything you do right, including having good intentions. But that don't cut it. You have to do the right thing. So God is coming, sending a, you know, in, in this prophetic dream, God is sending an angel to the king of Kajra and saying, I like your intent, but I don't like what you're doing. You have to see what's right to do. The objective way to live and act. Huh? Now, this king, by the way, he was no slouch, you know, uh, he wasn't lazy or anything. He was quite uh, conscientious to uphold, 
you know, the commandments, you know, uh, of the Qajar tribal religion. So, like, he, he was really trying to do the right thing. It wasn't like he had good intentions, but he does nothing. Like the uh, rich leftists in their ivory towers that really do nothing. Just tell us how to live. No, no, no. This guy was really doing to the best of his knowledge. And it still wasn't good enough. Because you have to seek out and be educated. What is the right thing to do? Not enough to just want to do the right thing and put effort. You have to you have a responsibility to double check, triple check, and make sure you are doing the right thing, right? Which is really the right thing to do in the eyes of God. Right? But this guy, he was no slouch. He was very, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, fastidious? You know, how do you pronounce it? He was very conscientious in his observance of the commandments of the tribal religion of the Kuzari. He took it upon himself to act as high priest. He uh, was in their temples and he sacrificed the sacrifices and he did it with a whole heart. So this guy was really trying, not just good intent, like ivory tower intent. Like these guys, like Bernie Sanders is rich, but he's telling us to be poor socialists. No, no, no. This guy was really doing and practicing what he, you know, practicing, putting in full practice is good intentions, but still not good enough, right? Because there's an objective right and wrong. Not enough to uh, have good intentions and to live those values. You have to do the objectively right thing. Yeah. So now the king, you know, when, the way he initially responded to these dreams was to even do pour it on even heavier. So like if he was acting as the high priest, you know, in the, in the temples two, three days a week, he did it every day of the week, just as an example. He just kept on pouring it on, you know, laying it on thick, doing even more was never good enough. The dream kept on coming back, said, you're, you know, your intent is good because he wants to do the right thing, but your deeds are not good. I mean, so no matter how pure the intent and how conscientious you are to try to live those values, you still have a responsibility to find out what is the objectively right thing to do and do that and nothing else. So this caused the king of Kuz of the Kuzarim to seek and to research all the different beliefs and 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 opinions and you know, and and uh, you know beliefs and opinions. So who Bam Kuzarim now in the end, right? In the end, what happened? You're jumping ahead. You're like, you know, way ahead, you know, uh, you know, to the basically to the end of the first section of this book, the book you know, being written in historical context. In the end of the story, not the end of this book, but you know, the end of the story as is chronicled uh, at the end of the first essay of this book, the king had converted, and because of him, a great number of the Kuzari people also converted. Now, many of the uh, of the arguments of the Chaver, hey, we spoke about Smichat Chaver earlier, right? You know, Chaver, you know, it's a oh, Talmudic term for a, a learned man, right? Uh, you know, so many of the arguments of the Chaver, the learned man, you know, cause me great pleasure because they actually sync nicely with the way I understand Judaism. So again, it, this is his. This is Halevi's philosophy. He just he heard, you know, he does not try to explain. He, he says this is his philosophy. But the things that he had heard attributed to the Chaver, which probably is not everything in this book, you know, the things that he had heard, the name, the arguments that that he had heard attributed to the Chaver, right, to the Rabbi, the argument for the King, you know, uh, were by and large, you know, fit with the way he understands, right. So that's why he definitely enjoyed it. Right. I'm going to write those arguments as they have uh, come down to us, and those who are wise will understand them. Again, no one really thinks that he had a complete transcript. This book is a transcript. It's not a transcript. What went on over there, you know, We what we believe is, like he basically said, he had heard some stuff, you know, some stuff. Attributed to the arguments king, and and he liked it, and he uh, filled it, you know, used it as a base, you know. <laughs> but of course, this book is 
exponentially more than the base that whatever he heard. But the whatever he heard, you know, fit nicely with his understandings of Judaism. So he's working with it, you know, as a historical context. And there's some of the stuff in this book were uh, things that uh, were supposedly said by the rabbi in front of the king of Kuzari some 400 years earlier. The Sopran. So now the way to, so going back to the story long, it is said, you know, the people have told us, that once it was, you know, revealed to the king of the Kuzarim in the dream, meaning repeatedly, right? It was made very clear that his his intent may be desirous because he really wants to do the right thing, but, you know, desirous and, you know, beloved in the eyes of Hashem, but his deeds are not beloved. That story goes on to say that to uh, remove all doubt, he was actively at one point actively commanded in the dream to seek out what is the objectively right thing to do that is would be desirous in the eyes of Hashem, in the eyes of God. So then, you know, in his research to find the truth, right, the objective right and wrong. Right. Uh, in his quest, he first turns to a philosopher and asks the philosopher what he believes in. This uh, philosopher is going to be like a composite of a lot of the uh, you know, the stuff in Greek philosophy. It's be a little Plato here, a little bit of Aristotle. Uh, or be by and large, uh, you know, a little uh, little uh, sampling, little smorgasbord of uh, Greek philosophy. Um, but we will start with this to, you know, uh, next time. That's why you got to subscribe. You got to subscribe to the channel because I myself can't tell you right now. I'm not like I'm not being spite. I myself cannot tell you when I will give the next Kuzari class. I intend to continue and be consistent. I just can't tell you exactly when. But I'm determined to gradually, you know, get through this book with you guys. But I myself don't know when it will be that I can tell you now. So therefore, you know, subscribe to the channel and you'll get notifications. You'll know when it's being delivered live and you'll and if you missed it, you'll know that another installment was delivered and you'll be sure to catch it. So please subscribe to our channel. The subscribe button. Mm -hmm. Right? Subscribe. See that on the screen? Subscribe. And also check out our website. We have so much. We have Parsha sheets you can print out before Shabbos. We have audios and videos on the Parsha, on the holidays, on philosophy. You know, lots of good stuff. So go to our website also, evanshasia.com. Go there and enjoy it. Enjoy it. But please, please subscribe to our uh, channel, you know, and that way you'll uh, you'll keep up with all this great stuff that we're offering. Yeah, but check out our website, evanshasia.com, and hit the subscribe button. Take care, everybody. And don't go to any leftist demonstrations. They're the real enemy. Don't endorse them. They're not our protectors. Take care.